The next unit of this course is called root locus diagrams. Um, we're going to spend quite some time on this topic. So I want to give you a quick summary about where we've been so far and where we're going to go. Uh, we have pretty much learned all we're going to learn about those three legs of the control table or the system design table. That system should be stable, systems should have good steady state error performance, and systems should be fast but not too overshooty. Think that that's what we, and we have now tools to determine the degree to which systems meet those criteria. Those are the very broad, usually you want your system to meet all of those three uh, checkboxes. But so far they have been presented in pretty much isolation. You do a stability check, or you do a steady state error check, or you do a transient metric check. What we will learn for the rest of the course is kind of holistic ways to look at designing systems that include many of those metrics uh, as kind of steps along the way. So drawing a root locus diagram is one of those holistic methods. Uh, so, I mean, there's no reason you would know what these are uh, to begin with, so let's, let's get started. We have seen a phenomenon that maybe before you analyzed feedback loops might not have been obvious, and that is if a parameter of a subsystem changes, I'm thinking any parameter in the kind of forward path transfer function, then the roots of the closed loop system of the entire system will vary. They will change. Even if the parameter that you're wiggling, I'm, I'm picturing like jiggling a parameter in the open loop system. Even if the parameter you're jiggling isn't a pole itself, right? If you are jiggling the gain of a open loop block, then that jiggle, that change in the gain will have ramifications on the closed loop pole locations. And so that's what this slide is trying to say, is that if we allow one parameter to vary continuously, so now maybe instead of a jiggle, think about uh, a, a knob or a rheostat. And if I change the value of that knob, or if I change the value of that parameter continuously, the roots of the closed loop system are going to move continuously. And that's a, that's a theorem from uh, complex analysis, uh, so I'm not really going to go into it here, but I hope that you can see that if I change one of the parameters continuously, the roots won't jump around. Okay, and that's what I mean by continuous movement in the plane. So when someone asks you, or when you are tasked with sketching the root locus diagram for a system, this is code for, what, it, what is meant by this is, you have to draw all the possible closed loop pole locations as this parameter changes, okay? So what we're usually gonna be doing here, so as parameter X varies, that's true. Most of the time, parameter X is gonna be the K, also called the open loop gain. Uh, usually. And so that's where this is also important that it's usually k greater than zero. Right, so if you were to able to successfully draw this picture, then you would have an image of all the possible closed loop pole locations as this k parameter changes. So to, to break down the, the terminology here, when I say root locus, uh, the root in that uh, phrase means a closed loop pole. And locus is uh, just Greek for a set of points. Okay. So let's see if we can do a really simple one. So let's say, so example, if I've got a proportional controller and a first order plant in negative feedback. What is the closed loop transfer function? Well, it's K over S plus one plus K. And so as K changes, the closed loop poles will change. So 
the closed loop holes are generally uh, complex numbers. So that's why these root locus diagrams are plotted on the complex plane. And so let's work through this. When K is zero, the closed loop hole is at negative one. And as K gets bigger, tell me where does that pole, where's the closed loop pole move? Left, right, up or down, or none of the above? No. Exactly right. So as K gets bigger, this thing gets bigger, which means that the closed loop pole moves further and further to the left. This is as K goes to infinity. Okay. So congratulations. This is our very first root locus diagram. This is the set of all points that are possible closed loop pole locations for some positive K. Okay, so all these, all these diagrams are, well, they're definitely parametric plots, right? Because there is no K axis here. I have to give you these little hints that this is where K, the roots are when K is small, and this is where the roots are when K gets big. So K is not explicitly presented as an independent variable, and yet K is the independent variable here. K is the thing that is changing and changing the resulting graphs, okay? So I think a lot of times I jump into kind of the harder root locus examples, but I, I think it's valuable to take a look at this is the simplest possible one I could think of. Um, do you understand what we're looking at here? Or does anyone not understand what we're looking at? So what's the value of this diagram? Before we get into the complicated ones, tell me, is this closed loop system ever unstable? No. It is never unstable because the closed loop poles are never in the right half plane. So we didn't have to do any Roth we didn't have to do anything. We just got the root locus diagram and we see that this is always stable. Now, always, provided that <laughs> what you mean by always is you have a positive value for K. Um, what else could we determine? Is this system ever underdamped? No, the roots of the system are always on the real axis, the root singular, I should say. Um, so this is always overdamped. Where I'm being a bit, a bit loose with my terminology here, I'm, it's a first order system, calling a first order system overdamped is a little abusive of, of terminology. But uh, what else could we say? We could say, if I want the system to be faster, should K be big or small? It should be bigger, yeah. It's got to be big. Didn't Fast poles are those sure. further yeah. to the left. Therefore, we got got to make K bigger if we want to make the system faster. So these are all things that you, like these are all concepts that you've learned in the past four weeks, and they tend to be easily derived from a finished or a completed root locus diagram. So that's the power that I, I hope to endow you with, is that once you have the root locus diagram, you could then make these kinds of statements. Is that clear? Yeah. So now the bad news. Um, if I want you to plot the locations of all possible closed loop roots, closed loop poles, uh, for all possible gains K, for all possible systems of arbitrary order, that's impossible. Uh, because of the theorem that you cannot find exact, uh, that there exist high order polynomials for which there is no exact formula for the roots. Okay, so that's the bad news. The good news is that there are situations, there are scenarios in which it is explicitly possible. For example, this situation, dead simple, first order, uh, you don't even need to know the quadratic formula to find those roots. Sometimes we will make use of the quadratic formula. Other times, and this is, the, this is the analogy I like to make here. So I picture these polynomials as like boxes of mystery. Okay, so here, stick with me. I know it's early and I know I'm getting a little uh, flowery here, but this is an opaque, opaque, call it a black box. 
And inside of it, inside are the true root locations. Right, but this thing is obscured from us. However, what I hope to teach you is there are pinpricks. There are little portholes that we can see inside. Okay, so what we're going to learn is how to find these little peepholes and we're going to learn how to manipulate them to tell us a little bit of information about the polynomial. Some of these will be approximate. Okay, so don't think that we are going to fully solve all of these uh, root finding problems. That's clearly impossible. But we are going to learn some techniques to find these little peepholes that, tell, that give us glimpses of where the roots could be under certain situations. Okay, this is probably, this is saying something. This is the worst picture I've drawn all quarter. Um, but I hope that the metaphor is there is that these polynomials are, 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 they hold their secrets and we're gonna learn some ways to take peaks at those secrets. Uh, these are those peaks that we're gonna get. We are going to find out what the open loop holes and zeros tell us about the closed loop holes. We are gonna learn uh, what the uh, parts of the real axis can be a closed loop hole. And we're gonna go through this list. And so by the end of this unit, I, I hope all seven of these procedures make sense to you. Okay, but this is, this is the preview. So, what do I mean when I talk about a closed loop pole versus an open loop pole? So let's be very clear, and I, this diagram is gonna be key to understanding that, is that the closed loop transfer function is exactly what I've been calling it all quarter. It is the transfer function from reference input to output, okay? And I'll, I'll be abbreviating this CLTF and usually trying to use the notation big T of S to represent the closed loop transfer function. Now, this is what throws some students for a loop uh, at this point in the class, is that I'm calling the open loop transfer function the entirety of the product of things around the loop. And I wanna let that sink in because it's important that we all agree on this notation, on this terminology. When I talk about the open loop transfer function, I am not talking about the system as it would be without feedback. That's not what I'm saying. Because if that were true, then H of S wouldn't appear. What I'm saying is that the open loop transfer function is just the thing in the denominator of the closed loop transfer function. Okay. And I'll be upfront with you. I don't think this is a great terminology for this thing because it implies something about opening the loop. I would prefer this to be called the loop transfer function or something like that. Um, but it is not, <laughs> not up to me to decide. Uh, this is, in all your textbooks, this is going to be called the open loop transfer function. And when I was taught this, it was just, you know, shut up, don't ask questions. The thing in the bottom of the closed loop transfer function is the open loop transfer function. And uh, look at me now. I'm telling you to do the same thing. <laughs> Any questions on this? Because it's, it's darn confusing. I, I, I'd be surprised if there weren't questions. Yeah, can you can you say that again in um, slow people speak? <laughs> or just rephrase that? So the closed loop transfer function is what you would want it to be. It's the transfer function from input to output. The open loop transfer function is the product of all the blocks around the loop. That's, I mean, that's as simple as I can make it. That answered that, thanks. Sure. Uh, so a bit of notation, the open loop transfer function, I'm going to call big L of S, kind of because I want to call it the loop transfer function. Um, and all I'm going to say is that L of S has M zeros and N poles, 
And because these are zeros and poles of the open loop transfer function, I'm going to call them open loop zeros and open loop poles. It's going to become really important and really annoying to differentiate between open loop poles and closed loop poles. A closed loop pole is anything that makes the denominator of the closed loop transfer function zero. So I'm over here on the right side of the slide now. A point in the plane is a closed loop pole if and only if it makes the closed loop transfer function infinite. And that only happens if the denominator, denominator of the closed loop transfer function equals zero when evaluated at that point. But we are calling this thing the open loop transfer function. So this is a way to talk about a closed loop pole. This is still a closed loop pole in terms of the open loop transfer function. And this is, we're jumping straight into <laughs> the word salad that is this unit. And that is, I am evaluating the open loop transfer function at a closed loop pole location, and I have to get negative one. Let me try that one more time. If this point in the plane S hat, so again, you can think of it as some random point. This is S hat in the complex plane. If S hat is a closed loop pole, then all of these statements have to be true on the right half of this slide including this last one, that the open loop transfer function evaluated at this pole at this location at this point must be negative one. So the, these double headed arrows means uh, is equivalent. So all of these statements here are equivalent, including the very last one, the boxed one. And that is that in general, L of S is a complex valued, complex argument function. Right, so in general, L of S maps the complex plane to the complex plane. Right, it's a function of complex numbers. Which means that L of S has a magnitude and it also has a phase. And so this statement, this single statement, is equivalent to these pair of statements. And these pair of statements get their own names. This first one is called the magnitude criterion. And this second one is called the phase criterion. They're called criteria because they are tests for whether S hat is a closed loop pole. So how can you imagine this going down? If I hand you a complex number, you could place that complex number into L of S. And if you got a magnitude one and a phase of 180, you could come back to me and say, hey, that complex number you handed me, that's a closed loop pole. Right, so this, these represent tests. This is what a criteria is, criterion is in, in math speak. It's tests that you can run to answer a question, yes or no. Uh, are you comfortable with this uh, plus or minus 180 mod 360 notation? Or is anyone rather uncomfortable with that? I'm not really sure what the mod means. <laughs> it means that if you get an answer bigger than 360, you can subtract 360 from it until your answer lies between plus or minus 180. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I think the, the most common explanation of modular arithmetic is an analog clock, um, mm -hmm. right? So that you, the hands go around, but once they get back to 12, they reset. So oh, okay. it's not okay. 12, it's 360. I got you. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I think the best way to explain how to build a root locus diagram is to build a root locus diagram. So this running example, we're going to take this through the next probably hour and a half of lecture. Um, so it's going to be, it's going to be important because everything builds on itself. So the question right now, and all we know is that there are two objects that are important to us, the open loop transfer function and the closed loop transfer function. So what I want to do now at this very first step of the example is write out the open and closed loop transfer functions. So 
the closed loop transfer function is just what you'd want it to be. It's the transfer function of the entire closed loop, um, which means takes the forward path, which is C times P, and divide it by one plus, because we've got a negative sign here, one plus the forward path times the feedback path transfer function. This is the open loop transfer function. And so uh, it's going to be relevant that we write it all out. So I'm going to take the values for C, P, and H and multiply them all together. So we get a K. There's only one zero, and that's up here at S plus two. And the poles, I think there are four of them. And S plus one plus J, S plus one minus J. Okay. Now, uh, you could write out the closed loop transfer function, but I don't think it would be very fruitful because once you simplify the closed loop transfer function to be a single polynomial over a single polynomial, that is with no nested fractions, the denominator of that closed loop transfer function is going to be a mess. It's not going to be factored. It's going to have k's all over the place. It's not actually going to be that helpful. You're free to do it, and I, I, it might be a worthwhile exercise just to sh just to convince yourself that I'm not hiding anything from you. But I don't think you'll be able to get very much from it. Now contrast that with let's find the open loop poles and zeros. Well, first off, little m is one. So there's one open loop zero. And that is at negative two. Little n is four. And these are the open loop poles. We've got one at negative one, negative three, negative one minus j, and negative one plus j. So this is, I hope you see that it's easier to calculate the open loop poles and zeros than it is to calculate the closed loop poles. In particular, it's because these open loop systems are simpler. And usually, if the parameter that we're going to vary is an open loop gain, the open loop poles and zeros are fixed in the plane, right? They don't move. They are not functions of k. Um, so these are, these are all fixed points in the S-plane, okay, which makes them easy to draw. <laughs> I think that's, that's their main selling point at this, at this stage. We're on good pace right now because I want to talk about this now and then I want to revamp it again on Friday. But let's talk about what the open loop poles and zeros tell us about the closed loop poles. So another title for this slide is what does what do the open loop poles and zeros tell us about the closed loop poles? If the answer is nothing, fine. But if the answer is something, this is another one of our little peepholes, or our, it's our first peephole into what the closed loop roots do. So let's analyze this in a kind of weird way. I'm going to take the open loop transfer function, and I'm going to write it as a numerator over a denominator, but I'm going to keep the k separate. Okay, so in our running example, n of s is just s plus 2, d of s is the product of s plus 1, s plus 3, s plus 1 plus j, and s plus 1 minus j. But uh, rather than writing that all out, I'm going to do this in general. The open loop transfer function will be some numerator over some denominator. Then, if I have, if s hat exists such that L of s hat equals negative one. And remember, this is, this is the key value because when the open loop transfer function equals negative one, you must have given it a closed loop pole. So a couple of things are equivalent. This means that of course, K N of s hat over D of s hat equals negative one. And then this, of course, means that k n of s hat 
equals d of s hat, which is also equivalent to, uh, sorry, negative d of s hat. Move the d of s hat over. That has to be zero. And lastly, we could divide this by k, and we get one on k times d of s hat plus n of s hat equals zero divided by k, which I'm going to call zero still. So the last thing I want to point out is if we take this expression and we let k get very, very small, we approximate this expression by d of s hat equals zero. Now tell me, what are the names for the s hats that make this true? D of s is the denominator of the open loop transfer function. Therefore, any s that makes that denominator zero, we would call an open loop pole, wouldn't we? I mean, that makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> so check this out. What do we just say? We just said that if k is small, the closed loop poles are also open loop poles. Now the weirdest thing is if we do the other way around and if we let k get very, very big, now all of a sudden the d term goes away and we can approximate this by n of s hat equals zero which means that s hat is an open loop zero. Yeah, you heard me right. s hat, a closed loop pole, is or approaches, however you want to say that, approaches the open loop zeros. So that's the answer to this question, is they give us start and end points. of the root locus, right? When k is small, when k is close to zero, the closed loop poles are near the open loop poles. But when k gets big, the closed loop poles are at or near the open loop zeros, according to this analysis. Okay, I want you to, to chew on that for a couple days, and we will revisit it on Friday. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.